faith, trust, and prayer. And as we look at, and I, I mentioned a little er this earlier, that many times in the past, you know, when I was growing up, and, um, you know, there were all these arguments that the Bible, you know, archaeologists are proving the Bible doesn't exist. There was this lady who went to Jericho, and she dug in Jericho as an archaeologist and dug through all the things, and she says that the, that the, the children of Israel didn't come. They weren't here at all. You know, they, they were here before there ever was even a city. And, I mean, she went through all this stuff. And she was a renowned uh, archaeologist. And, you know, and, and people had a hard time in looking at that. And, of course, since then she's been totally disproved, disproven. But there were all these arguments that the timelines of the Scripture didn't measure up with the timelines uh, of history and that digging through the archaeological sites and, you know, the top layers, and then you go down, you go down, you go down to bedrock. And so there can be numbers of layers for the sites that you can go to and, and take them down to bedrock. Well, the over the years, these last few years especially, that especially the Christian archaeologists, are they go in with an open mind to allow the uh, allow the pottery, and that's pr primarily what they use to um, de designate what time frame, what time frame, these uh, cities and these tells. A tell is a place where they keep they build on top of one another. Um, uh, they build a city. Somebody comes in and conquers it, and you know, so don't rebuild where they were at. Just you just fill that in and start building again, and they keep doing that. And we talked a little bit about that with, um, with Jerusalem and how that it has been built and there's numbers of layers and a lot of what happened at the time of Christ. You're not walking on the same streets that Jesus did. They're about 10 feet below. <laughs> so there's all those types of things. But now they're proving that um, the scriptures are correct and that the things that we have read about in the scriptures, we don't have to believe that the scriptures are right. They are right. <laughs> and we, you know, we're not trying to rewrite history. We're, we are looking at interpreting it correctly and putting the timelines and the time frames together so that we have an accurate um, description and an accurate presentation of what happens in the Bible, what happens in, in, you know, what happened in Israel, what happened in Egypt. So we're going to start off with Genesis 47, verses 5 and 6. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen, and if you know of any among them with special abilities. Sometimes I, I never read that. <laughs> if any of your family have special abilities with handling livestock, put them in charge of my, Pharaoh saying, I want them to be in charge of all my livestock. Oh, okay. You know, um, I've often wondered, okay, what happened when they got to Israel? How long were they there before they became slaves? How long before everything changed? Well, there is a city in um, the land of Goshen. If you were looking at, so, um, the Nile River comes down and into the Mediterranean Sea, and this is the land of Goshen. This one doesn't write too well. And that's the land of Goshen. And Goshen has a city named Avaris. Now, this is a large area, this land of Goshen here, and it's like the delta where the, where the Nile River would flood, and all of the good stuff from the north northern part would wash down here, just you know, just like our floods recently, <laughs> that everything washes out on the roads. Well, this washes out, and this is the Mediterranean Sea here, and um, the land of Goshen, and then Avaris is a city about right there, and the um, Dead Sea's up here, and um, the other what is the sea? Sea of Reeds, where Moses crosses the Red Sea. So anyhow, they, this is the this is the northern kingdom of, of, of um, Egypt, and this is the southern kingdom. 
All right, so we have um, when Moses enters into uh, Egypt, excuse me, when Joseph enters into Egypt, he enters into the southern kingdom. Okay, that's important. Because they live there and they live in favor with Pharaoh. Pharaoh, you know, he, he likes them for who they are and uh, they get along very well. And what happens is um, we know that the dividing northern kingdom, they had two different Pharaohs, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. So when Joseph and his family entered Egypt in the land of Goshen, they took over the livestock of the king of Pharaoh and they lived there. Now, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So what happened was this guy, Tutmose I, is the ruler of the northern kingdom. He comes and he wipes out the southern king, the southern pharaoh, and he controls it. But he doesn't know about Joseph. He has no understanding about Joseph. And so he comes down and he takes over um, the southern kingdom. So we'll read on. Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we are. So what happens is this Tutmos the first, we'll just call him King Tut the first, um, he's afraid of the children of Israel. They are so vast in number, he's afraid that they're going to join with their enemies and fight with their enemies to destroy Egypt. So he comes down and he takes, he, you know, conquers southern Egypt and he um, wants to enslave <laughs> um, the people, the sons of Israel, more mighty. Come, let us deal wisely with them, is what he says, or else they will multiply and in the event of war, they will join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us. Depart from the land, you know, and depart from the land. So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Oh, so this is when the, the children of Israel become slaves. So it's about 275 years from when um, Joseph and... Um, goes into Egypt, so it's about 275, somewhere in there. Then verse 22, Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you are to cast it into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. Oh, so now <laughs> Tutmos is uh, afraid uh, of them being too great, so what does he decide? Kill all the males. Does that sound familiar? Now we know that this goes, oh, Moses. <laughs> Moses is the guy. So you got the northern kingdom, you got Tutmos the first, and he, he enslaves the Egypt, enslaves the children of Israel. All right. So we we'll erase that. Since you have a mental picture of it, and it's all good. There'll be a quiz after we're finished. So I tried to do this ahead of time, so you wouldn't be confused. So. What happens now is you have Tutmos the first. He's the ruler of the northern kingdom. He goes down and conquers the southern kingdom. Well, he is married to ah ah Amos, and they have a daughter named Hat Chepsut. The the guy Hat Chepsut, okay. That's what the guy in in in, in Egypt told me. That's how we remember it. Hat a Chepsut, okay. So hot a cheap suit, um, she is the daughter uh, of Tutmos and Amos, and then there is Mot 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 Motenfet, okay? That's not how you pronounce it. He, that um, she's a concubine, so Tutmos has a concubine. They have a son named Tutmos II. Okay, well, in, in Egypt, you've got to keep the line, lineage pure, so they marry each other. So you have Hatshepsut and Tutmos getting married, and they have a daughter, Nefera, Nefera Ra, sun, sun god. But somewhere in here, somewhere in that period, is when Hatshepsut 
wants to have a son. And tradition, and this is one of the, one of the Jewish, Jewish, one of the Egyptian historians said that she goes to the Nile River God, and I have it written down somewhere, the name of that God. Um, she goes to the Nile River God and prays that she would get a son. So what does she find in the Nile River? <laughs> she finds a baby. And why is there a baby in the Nile River? Because he wants the uh, Tutmos, the first, wants all male babies killed. So the mother of Moses keeps him for three or four months. He gets too big, too loud, noisy. <laughs> and so she makes a, a basket of pitch and reeds and stuff, puts it in the reeds where Hot Ship Suit is taking a bath. And so she finds Moses in the Nile and takes him as her son. Hmm. So Moses then is somewhere in here, and he is uh, the, the mother. Hot Sheep Suit is his mother. And um, so um, Tutmos and Hot Sheep Suit have the Pharaoh, but she kind of goes off the picture somewhere. We don't know what happened to her. But then Tutmos and Aset, his concubine, has a son named Tutmos III. Imagine that. Tutmosis is actually the way it's pronounced. Tutmosis III. And when they have this, when they have this child, Tutmos II dies. He didn't have the baby, but he died. Okay. So he has the baby, and he dies. Well, Tutmos III now is the new Pharaoh, but he's a baby. He can't be Pharaoh. So what does any good queen descendant do? Hot sheep suit becomes Pharaoh of Egypt. That's, that's her um, burial palace, burial place. I was there, <laughs> fortunately. Uh, they left me back out of the country. But um, that was her burial palace. So she was, she was a very powerful king, very, very powerful uh, Pharaoh. She dressed up like a man because she lived in a man's world. She's the only woman to be Pharaoh. So she assumed that position until Tutmos III gets old enough. So you can imagine now, we don't know how old Moses is, but Moses is growing with Tutmos III. He's growing up with his foster brother uh, in the palace. So Moses is older than Tutmos III, but somewhere in there we know that she uh, reigns alone and then she co-reigns with Tutmos III when he gets old enough. Now, Tutmos III, he reigns for 45 years. And it's important that when putting the genealogies together and the timelines, this Tutmos, this reign here has to be more than 40, 40 years. Because Moses flees when he's 40 years old, and he returns when he's 80. So somewhere in here, Moses flees under Tutmosis, Tutmos III's reign. And Hot Sheep Suit is the one who, is the, who raised Moses in the courts of Pharaoh. Now, then we have um, Tutmos ruling by himself. And he and his father are very cruel, <laughs> and grandfather, they're very cruel to the um, Israelites. And we have, well, we have the birth of Moses in Exodus 2. And, you know, we have it when, when, she was, when she could hide him no longer, she put a pap papyrus basket and put him in the, in the Nile. And she had, um, Mo the mother of Moses had his sister, Miriam, watch over him, and so when Hot Sheep Suit took him out of the Nile, Miriam says, I got somebody who will watch your kid. <laughs> so, and Moses, his mother got to raise him. So she asked, do you want me to go get someone to, uh, to watch the child? And she did, she went and got her mother. Uh, so the, the Pharaoh of the north then has conquered the south, and he's in place. Uh, Exodus 2, one day after Moses was grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and watched them in their labor. 
he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Looking this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked one of them, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrews? The man said, who made you rule over and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me like you killed the Egyptians? Uh Uh-oh, Moses blew it. (laughs) So he um, has killed an Egyptian and somewhere in here he leaves, he flees for his life because Tutmos III here doesn't look too highly on sharing his kingdom with, with, a, with a Hebrew. And so, 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. This is, this is um, people have always tried to, how do we know that Moses returns uh, and, and the children of Israel leave Egypt on April 24th, 1446 B.C.? <laughs> she laughed. How, how, how do we know that's what happened? Well, we find that in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, then in the 480th year after Israel, Israelites uh, came out of Egypt. Oh, 480 years, and what's going on? Solomon is building his temple, and he is beginning the temple on the day after Passover. So you use Solomon's record of 480 years prior is when Moses, whenever the children of Israel left Egypt on Passover because that's when the angel of death passed over, um, passed over the first, you know, the children of Israel and the angel of death uh, all the, the firstborn of all the um, people of, of, of Egypt, the livestock and every firstborn all died. Now, one of the other things before I go on. Um, so uh, Amenhotep II, he's the guy, he's laid out in his best robes. He's a mummy. This is the guy who was ruling and said no to Moses. And if you and we don't have to get a close up on his face, but his face is filled with uh, growths all over him. We don't they, they, they just surmise they haven't proven what it is. So they don't cut him up and stuff. But um, they think that it might be from the plagues. <laughs> that this that might be the markings left from the plagues. There it is. So anyhow, that's the guy who said no to Moses. And uh, so what happens is. A um, couple of things. There's, there's writings in some of his manuscripts, in some of his... It, it, it's interesting. They call them steles. Um, there is one uh, the tablet. There's a tablet even up to Penn State in the uh, museum that has uh, ha- Hatshepsut's name and things on, but they are, it's chiseled out. Why? Because... Amenhotep III is faced with the ten plagues of Moses. Who brought Moses into this world? Hatshepsut. So everything that has dealt with her in Egyptian history, he wants to deface and take her off because in, in Egyptian society, if you get rid of their names, get rid of everything that's written about them, they have no claims to an afterlife. So he is tr- trying to get even with hot cheap suit for bringing and keeping Moses and making and getting the children of Israel to leave. So they left on April 24th. So I just wanted you to know that. <laughs> so what we also know of Amenhotep III, his firstborn son dies mysteriously because the, the Pharaoh that's after him is the second son. He fits the plagues. Um, He has a writing that decrees that there are magicians in our land performing performing magic arts. Don't listen to them. Um, As we said, every object or every uh, writing of hat shaped suit is chiseled off or whatever, except for a couple. And, And, of course, they didn't get them all. 
the city of Avera, remember I said Avera down in the, in the peninsula down in Goshen, the city of Avera down in Goshen, this is kind of, you know, the Nile comes down, and it's, big, it's a big city. And this is where all the children of Israel le- lived. And in the archaeological digs, they have found the, ta- the homes and pottery from the Ca- Canaanite cities in, in Cana because these guys had a big trade going on with the Canaanites um, and the, the, you know, the from that land. And so uh, and in uh, 1486, the all the pottery and everything stopped. It's, it's abandoned because that's where the children of Israel were. And so he lost, uh, in his early days, Amenhotep III, he had, he had a number of conquests. He marched against um, in, in some of the, he expanded the kingdom in, uh, up into, e- uh, out of Egypt, up into north of, uh, of, of where Israel is today, up into, the, up into that area. He was known as the, uh, no, his, his uh, father was known as the Napoleon. And uh, the first year of Pharaoh's three campaigns, after the exodus, okay, after the exodus, after the children of Israel are gone, um, their whole society runs on slaves. So what did Amenhotep III do? He raided Cana and took 100,000 people as slaves. <laughs> Why? He needed them to fill in where the children of Israel had left. <laughs> so those are just some of the things that um, point us to um, that the, the, authentic, the authenticity of the scriptures are played out in, in real time and how that when you, when you start putting them together, as Solomon says, 480 years from today, and he writes, he writes down the date and so on, 400 years ago back, that's when Moses went out of Israel with the children of, uh, children of Israel. So that puts us at what time period? Uh, four, I think it's 14, 1446. Um, they leave. E- they leave um, Egypt. So, so if you add four eighty years to that, you have when Moses was a, the year that Moses was born. So, isn't that interesting? I watched all these archaeologists, and there's about four or five of them to get their get their lowdown on all that stuff. But the, that, in, in turn, takes me to uh, prayer. And what does is, what is all of this have to do with praying? Well, number one, as we look at history, you see, we don't have to believe that the Bible is true. The Bible is true. And if people say that it isn't, it, they just haven't found the right information yet. Or they've been looking in the wrong places. So, The Bible is true. So prayer is our understanding. God tells us to pray. So we don't have to believe in the Bible to believe the words of Jesus, to believe that God will hear us when we pray. These are already established. I don't have to tell you to believe in Abraham Lincoln. Why? Because we know him as a historical figure. Now, maybe some of the things that are written about him, people have distorted, things like that. You just never know. But the Bible is not a distortion. The Bible is a factual presentation of what God is saying. So when it comes to the New Testament then, that there are, uh, there's a a top, (laughs) a guy has the top 10 reasons that uh, Jesus is risen from the dead that are not, not, not in the Bible, that are not in the scriptural text. It's in other texts. So we find that these things are true. Now Jesus is telling us that we ought to pray. What does he say here in, um, in Matthew 7, 7? Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receiveth, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. So the declaration of that truth. See, we don't have to believe that that is true. We have to understand that it is true. We don't have to believe that Israel left Egypt. We know that it's true. It's a, factual, it's a factual event in history verified by Scripture and by the timelines given in Exodus, Genesis, and Exodus, and, and, and so on. So 
We don't have to believe that it's true. We know that it's true. We don't have to believe that Jesus is telling us to seek and to ask and to knock and, you know, everything will be open to us. We know that that is factual, that it is, it is true, it is historical fact. Jesus is telling you and I, you need to pray. Why? Because he loves to hear from you. <laughs> he loves to hear from you. He loves to know that his children, you see, when should we pray? Well, there, there, it talks about triggers to pray. When you start your car, now you may be riding with somebody that they start the car and you begin to pray. <laughs> okay? You, you know that God, if, if God doesn't intervene, we're going to die. All right. But uh, no, but there are triggers that we have when we pray. We could pray. Whenever you get out of the car, pray. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, have a prayer. Before you eat, have a prayer. That we set times and, and situations to pray. Like when we hear somebody really disgusting, pray for them. Don't get caught up in their disgust. But pray for them that God would save them, that heal them, restore them, bring them, bring them to the kingdom of God. Because we are the light of the world in which we are shining the light of Christ into their life. We don't know how that light is going to be received, but we never stop shining. Um, so whenever you pray, it's a matter of respecting and, and honoring God. We have the Lord's Prayer. Uh, we approach God with deep respect and worship. Why? Because he is holy. We're not holy. He's holy. But we, he, he has given us permission that we can come right into the very throne room of God. This is not faith. It is fact that God tells us this. Jesus tells us this. So we are to do this. We are to believe that when we pray, we enter right into the, the throne room of God because it is factual. He wouldn't tell us to do that if it wasn't true. Whenever Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also, that in my Father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare this place for you. So we find that that is a factual event that is taking place in the heavens, and we are going to be there someday, but until then, it's, it's fact. Just as real as Moses bringing out the, the children of Israel from Egypt, so are the scriptures telling us what God has planned for us. So we enter into his presence with respect and worship. God wants us to prioritize. <laughs> Remember to serve him, to pray about his purpose and his, his, um, his plan for us. Present your need before the Lord. I have it somewhere. Say what you mean, we know what you say. <laughs> you know, don't do wishes and wishes and wants and maybes and so on. No, it's it's put it out there what you want, what you're praying about. Be be bold and be be on task. Put it out there before the Lord because He wants to hear. He wants you to present your heart to Him. He already knows what's on your heart. He wants you to be honest with yourself and with Him so that you can pray. And the assurance that we have is that God wants us to pray. He says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Boldly like you belong there. So we come boldly to God. You ask for forgiveness and forgiving others. Forgive others. May I forgive others as God has forgiven me. We appeal for protection and deliverance from Satan. God, keep me from the evil one. See, God who knows our thoughts and intentions desires that we direct those thoughts and intentions to worship and to prayer and to thanksgiving and present them to him. So what happens in the process? Sin tries to get us off course. Remember, there are three voices. There's our own, there's the humanistic or thinking, and there, there, there's, there's God, the Holy Spirit, there's ours, God, the Holy Spirit, and Satan, evil. So they're always contending for what you're going to do next. Believe what the word of God says. Sins are forgiven. Temptations come. Ask God to give us victory over them and to, to go through the process because he wants to hear from us. And so um, the Phillips translation of Romans 8.26 says, The Spirit of God not only maintains this hope within us, but helps us in our present limitations. I don't know how to pray very well. The Holy Spirit, you confessed your sin, Christ is in you, 
the Holy Spirit is there. For example, we do not know how to pray worthily as the Son of God, but his Spirit within us is actually praying for us in those agonizing longings which never find words. God, who knows the heart's secrets and understands them, of course, the Spirit's intention as he prays for those who love God. The Holy Spirit prays through you with your sighing and groanings and things like that. So God knows what's on your heart. Um, so combining these two, sub two subjects, uh, prayer and hi history and archaeology, uh, to recognize the true facts that are stated in the Bible as historical facts. And when someone says that, what is, there was a movie out, um, they discovered Christ's tomb. It's garbage. <laughs> it's, it's a lie. And that one itself, the, the people who are used in there as scientists have, with, with a Christian, they're, they're, si they're not Christians, but they, they, uh, rec they took back everything that was on that film because those who made the film cut and pasted things to, to make it sound like they believed that this was the bones of Jesus. And they didn't. They didn't believe that. But you see, the, the devil will do anything to get us to question. So our facts are written down. They are in the scriptures. And now, it's, uh, now it's up to us to take what our, what our faith is and take the security of what we know in our relationship with God and come to him in prayer. Bring our needs before him in prayer. Don't hesitate to pray. Because him, the Holy Spirit, is in us, quickening us to thank him. To take this need, take this difficulty, take this decision, whatever it is, bring it to the Lord in prayer. Because every scripture, every word, everything is true that is written in his word. Even the, you know, and especially ask, seek, knock. Amen? Jesus, we thank you for hearing our prayers and thank you for helping us understand your word that we can put timelines and dates and all these things together because of what is in your word and that we can take that to these places on earth and we can offer our, the archaeologists to, archaeologists to dig and find exactly what you said and what cities were there. We ask, Lord, for you to take your word and let it lodge in our hearts and minds. Protect us, guard us, guide us, influence us by your spirit to pray, to seek, to knock. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.